Uh, the gift of Donald Trump, really, to a certain extent, yeah. that uh, you know, you have Might now. You open. know, no, I got okay. It. Now you know where his, you know, where his population is. They've always thought that way. Yeah. They were in the dark. Yeah. They were kind of, you know, operating in the fringes, but they were still that thought, that that pernicious, rapacious thought was still out there someplace. And now we get to see is like, oh, and now we can say to white people, that's not, that's not my job. I'm not going to do anything about that thing. That is your gig. There it is. You covered it. Those are your relatives. Yeah. You thought it was funny when they were talking about yeah. uh, that the president was a Muslim. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's so crazy. Yeah. Donald Trump has been a thug and a con yep. for ever, yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. He is not the apprentice. Yeah. And, and, and he's it's, just the apprentice president. Because I, I had a lot of friends who I graduated with who stayed in Kentucky and who I got into, not arguments, but debates with about mm -hmm. Um, Trump's presidency, and I've never, I'm not a, Baltimore has been democratic for as long as I can remember. Right. And I've, I, when I went to Park, I would get in arguments with my friends about mm -hmm. um, city leaders and about access and li the liberal agenda sure. and all this other stuff that I never benefited from. Sure. I never saw the benefits from it in my right. neighborhood. I saw a disparity. I saw people rerouting funds. I saw people saying they were doing one thing and it was really Doing another thing right. or whatever. So. That to them, to those people, like you're saying, that's so important. To those people, their experience is real. Mm -hmm. And once you write off that experience, you really solidify the, that divide. Sure. You eliminate any chance of you being like, yo, y'all schools is fucked up. Yo, our schools is fucked up too. Mm -hmm. Yo, the government supposed to be doing this for our schools. Mm -hmm. Yo, why don't we? You eliminate that once you say, yo, you white, so your schools can't be fucked up. Mm -hmm. Go to them schools in Kentucky. Oh my God! They are horrible. Because poor people are basically it's, treated the same. It's just well, you know that's that's the that's the power of understanding a little bit about history. You know, Bacon's Rebellion happened because they figured out that Native Americans, blacks, and poor whites were treated the same, yep. and so that's why they figured actually it's the elites. Mm -hmm. That's when whiteness rose. Mm -hmm. As a, oh well, at least you can mm -hmm. have, be aspirational mm -hmm. to one day be a part of the elite. You'll look mm -hmm. you at least look like me, mm -hmm. right? And so if, in fact, you are easily persuaded to do that, they actually placed a monetary value on whiteness. You could have land, mm -hmm. you could have a gun, mm -hmm. you could have so many provisions mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. So the white people that participated in the rebellion got a little bit of punishment for blacks, mm -hmm. it was permanent. So when you understand that and you see that fast track to now, the only thing that you really have an obligation to do, I think, is to make sure that the young don't get away yeah. with just chewing bullshit when they're talking to you. It's like, well, even my own daughter. I was like, where'd you get that from? Well, I heard, it was like, from where? Because sources are a man. Oh, I kind of read it on the internet. Well, let's find a source. Because if it was, you know, chewyboogers.com is where you got it from, yeah. that is not necessarily a trusted source of information, nor are your friends that they got it from, chewyboogers.com. So yes. let's dig into yeah. that and find out where you got that Absolutely. from, because the facts might lead you to a different conclusion. Yeah. And eventually, she started digging into source material and going, oh, Dad, I didn't really know that. He's like, I know you didn't know because you know what? You're 16 years old. And, but now you're 25. You can't afford the same amount of you know, delusions about what it is, nor do I want you to be, um, I don't want you to become unhopeful yeah. about the future. Because when you get into that, they're not buying into it in the same way that their parents and grandparents or great-grandparents did. Because you have accessible to you almost everything ever written about the thing that you want to talk about wow. on your phone. I had to go to the library and get six books at a time. Mm -hmm. There was a limit. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. I think that's part of why I'm so hopeful that uh, the information will free you <coughs> and B, the debate is, um, is available and accessible. You know, like we don't need to have this conversation only on NBC News. We can put this out on your own channel, make your own. If your channel has 100,000 people, that's the only things people are going to be watching anyway Absolutely. at that hour. Absolutely. So those 100,000 people sharing it one time, and you've crushed yeah. NBC locally. Absolutely. Or Fox News Absolutely. locally, where the nonsense is. It's like, oh, I don't know if I agree with any of those guys, yeah. but they weren't just making it up. Yeah, and it wasn't just an attack on me because I uh, have a certain opinion about a specific thing. Sure. And it's what you were saying about, about yelling, about people just coming into the debate, 
strictly to get what they got to get off their chest and roll out. All right. Like it has, it, they don't want change. They don't want progress. Um, this is on both sides of the aisle yeah. or whatever. And I, I was forced uh, to suspend my own uh, preconceived notions about who, what someone is when I first look at them mm -hmm. or what have you. And I, I, you know, I, I got a million anecdotal stories, but one story I, I never forget. I'm on the side of the road and I'm driving between um, Berea and Danville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, cornfields and right. nobody, no lights, right. nothing, nothing. And no street lights. Right. And it's, cr it's crazy <laughs> out there. Right. And I used to play uh, piano at a church. So we went late night Thursday, me and my friend, for rehearsal. So he drove me, we driving back, la 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 la. Out of nowhere, boom. Right. And we lean in, come to find out a wheel spun off. Mm. Wheel spun off, and we saw the track of the wheel go into the corn brush, field. into okay. the cornfield, right. down, right. Right. and we don't, it's pitch black. Right. Pitch, pitch black. Right. We don't know if it's water, right. we're hearing noises. Right. He's from uh, New York, I'm okay. from Baltimore. <laughs> like, we ain't built They're for going to no corn We ain't, right. we ain't exactly. going to no marsh, right. nothing, right. none right. of that. Right. Right. I will watch it on TV, I will not be there. Right. Um, so we're, and I'll you know, say no, it's everything that could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. And we see this pickup truck, and, um, and we just, we, you know, we think of every movie you that has ever existed. You the banjos in the we background. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't gonna turn out well. <laughs> For real. And I'm thinking of every, so I'm thinking, my friends used to call me Obama because I could talk to white people right. or whatever. So be like, oh, go ahead, Obama, go ahead. Right. So I'm thinking about, okay, what I got to say to this dude to finesse us out of this situation, sure. right? Whatever we got to do to get up out of here because right. we halfway in between. So dude walks up and he is as uh, Kentucky as they get. You know, how y'all doing? What y'all doing out here this late at night, fellas? But, I mean, everything he said yes. was out the movie. Right. <laughs> Until the point he right. said, all right, well, let me help you. Right. And... You're talking about sigh of relief. Sure. Right. No phone. No gave us his phone. Sure. He happened to be a. Um, he just volunteers to drive those back roads and help people. That. Wow. That's what he does. He just. Sure. He's not a. He's a volunteer. Whatever. Mm -hmm. That that emergency person. Sure. And my friend in particular, he had um, moved from New York to Birmingham, mm. and he had a lot had a lot of bad experiences with racism sure. and had never had one good experience with a white person, mm. um, especially an older white right, male right, right. gentleman. Right. And so to him, that was his reality. His sure. reality was this is what an old white Southern dude does, mm. period, because mm -hmm. every version of that person did it. And here it is. I never forget. I mean, he was just like, oh, what? Like, no, for real. Like, you know, can we change? He do had the... Um, had the what's that thing they be wearing fly fishing right that whole the get up gators on, the right. gate yeah the whole thing went into the thing found a wheel this is your wheel blah blah put it wow. on his jet i mean the right. whole thing y'all sure. need me to drive with y'all back to school wow didn't ask for nothing i don't even know the guy's name to this day um but i'd had other experiences like that mm. that for me that has started to um shift or open my um perspective on what a reality could be mm -hmm. and not to buy into this narrative of you are black and you have to not like everyone that is not sure. blah, 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 simply because you are whatever. Uh, I think, you know, but your friend's experience makes it very difficult to afford that, to, to credit that to of a person course. who's wandering in. Uh, you know, I was really lucky when I was little growing up in Washington, D.C. because you know, Washington, D.C. is a black city mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Like, a black, the mayor was black, post, postmaster was black, wow. police chief was black. And so I never had a sense of white people being the enemy, or even particularly in power. They were, they were the teachers, and they were, because I went to Catholic school. And so I had white friends as a child. My parents had white friends as a child, because they were sometimes the first black person to work here or there. So by the time that brand of the other version, the one that your friend ran into, by the time I met that person who could actually turn on you because of your color, I was like 14. Okay. It was almost a little bit too late because then it was like, what's wrong with you? Not what's wrong with me. See, if, you, if that had been my experience constantly when I was a kid, you internalize that, you think something's wrong with you. Well, it's like, what is it about this? Because everybody else thinks I'm adorable, but I'm in this other scenario and someone's willing to actually 
uh, you know, butcher me. I was born three months before uh, Emmett Till was murdered. So when I was learning how to read, that little book was on every coffee table at every auntie's house. I'm one of 10 kids and my father's one of 10. So I had lots of adults around. And so my mother said I would actually go and just turn to that page because I didn't recognize it as a child. I was like, what is this? It looks like a monster. Um, and you realize that this monstrosity is kind of an idea that is locked in people's heads. And it's like the old song, you have to be carefully taught. You could actually hang out with a kid who would be your friend in study hall. And once he went into this other realm over here, like with his buddies on the playground, that same person could turn on you with ferocity. Um, mm. And so that was troubling for a while. I mean, emotionally troubling for me for a long while. But because of my parents, not particularly being like civil rights people, but just because they were who they were, like my brothers and I never wanted to go shopping with my mother. We were like, lady, please put my mother's change in her hand. And please don't say, don't suck your teeth. Don't do anything or we're going to be here all day. Yeah. Um, and so you, that also was a part of me. So I would become enraged really quickly if that other, and I'm still extremely intolerant of that. I like, I'll investigate for a little while because I, like you, yeah. I, you know, I know I yeah. talk to white uh -huh. people and I was like, are you having a bad day? Because I'm about to fucking get in yeah. your ass. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I always have to keep the Hulk like suppressed. Absolutely. But I also don't go looking for it because I can go just about anywhere. And I, can, I choose to continue to go anywhere. But that doesn't negate the experience of your friend, my exactly. other friends who can show up and not have any other kind of privilege other than you don't know they're a PhD, but they just look a certain kind of way because my brother was dragged out of his Mercedes Benz in Berkeley. I've been accosted by black officers in other places. I've seen white people do all kinds of things. I've seen black people do all kinds of things. So sometimes it boils down to what is, uh, what is humane or inhumane in their own experience. Like, where did they put that together? Yeah. Because basically, the other guy is always who I'm looking for. Exactly. People are basically decent, unless you, it's almost like child abuse. You yeah. know, if you say, yeah. you know, niggas ain't shit, uh -huh. and you tell a three-year-old that for a long time, they don't know what you're talking yeah. about. But after a while, they'll get it. Like, yeah. in this house, yeah. you can't, you can't, be friends with that kid Absolutely. and can't bring them home because you'll watch this sea change. So I think that's what is, um, is so powerful about the moment that we're in, having lived long enough and seeing the sea change. There was no millennial generation with access to everything. They were only able to listen to what grandpa said. It's like, I don't know if that's true. Let me just Google that and see if actually it doesn't say that niggas ain't shit. It actually says that all the heroes in the world that we say they admire seem to be black and brown. Yeah. So what's the, you know, so there's that yeah. dissonance that happens. Absolutely. And so that's one thing. And then the other part of it is they're going to inherit trillions of dollars. So the question is, they're still going to have privilege. How will they use it? Like you have privilege because of who your parents are, mm -hmm. uh, how you're well, you're educated, you know, your, 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 that, that ability to be Obama is not because you grew up in Hawaii. No. It's because you know how to navigate in Absolutely. the world. There's a certain amount of expectation that your int intellect is going to help you navigate. And we all have that expectation of your generation now. It's like the, the, it's the old adage of you are your ancestor's dream. You literally are. But all this other stuff that happened in the middle is not going to go poof. It's not like the war on drugs, which was the war on the poor, which is the, all the ways that the system s is fixed to scam black people out of every penny that they have. They have lived off of that and built every institution in America on that. I mean, ta Coates is absolutely right. It's plunder. When you actually investigate and you see, wow, none of us could work in any office. If there was, there was one black person there, and they dare not hire another. That person, even as the head of HR, two of us together in the same office, like, hey, oh, 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 Fred, what are you doing? Hey, you're trying to turn this into a Black Panther party or something? You know what I'm saying? But those, those, those movements that emerged broke free of a certain... I had a white uh, Jesuit priest introduce me to the Black Panthers wow. when I was 13. Wow. And I never forgot it. Uh, he's probably not a, a Jesuit priest anymore. Brother Cawthorn, I hope he's still around and with us yeah. because without him, we would have been by ourselves on that campus. 20 kids when I started, two when I graduated. 20 black kids when I graduated. 
I mean, even two, when I, two black kids when I graduated. It was not because they were not smart. That's the story. They were all the smartest kids in their class. They just couldn't take the pressure, not from the kids, from the teachers, from the establishment. It's like, we're just tolerating you. We have to let you in because you can sit over there, but we're not going to push you. We're not going to do any of those other kinds of things. So that is not my daughter's experience. Mm. And I was 40 when she was born. So it's been a, you know, it's been a little, I, she could have been my granddaughter at this point, right? Yeah. But I'm so hopeful about the fact that there are so many people out there that are <coughs> wired so differently. And I've been blessed, and many others have been blessed, to have traveled. I've been literally all over the world to a certain extent. Not, you know, everywhere, but I've been in a lot of different places. And I've seen what poverty will do in a lot of different places. And as you said about, you know, poor whites in Kentucky, mm -hmm. they're not ballers. That is, that is, you know, that is not a high level of experience that they're having. But for them to take that transition and go, oh, wow, we're all getting our clocks clean by the same elite that stole our environment, that's poisoning our environment, that's overcharging for medicine, that's flooding our communities with opioids. Now everybody's saying, ah, and so we can say, oh, okay, you know what's just? If they get forbearance, everybody gets it. And that's, and, that was never possible before now. And that's, and that, I think that is the, I remember I was in a uh, civil, civil liberties, civil, uh, civil liberties class, whatever. And I, was, I think I was the only black person in that class. Um, and I remember we were going through a list of, uh, like, you get points for how you grew up, with mm. points for this, points for that, or whatever. And um, I was, my, my childhood experience um, in um, Edmondson, Midtown Edmondson, was the most similar mm -hmm. to a person who grew up in a trailer park mm -hmm. um, in that place. And I remember really having a conversation like, oh, your, your parents weren't together? Oh, you did the food mm -hmm. stamp? Mm -hmm. This, that? Mm -hmm. oh, oh. Like, really, like, almost everything. Right. Um, right. To the point when I think where people can seem to get caught up is who gets out first. Mm. It's like, we, like, okay, now we're at the point where, okay, I get it. We're in the same boat. But... Um, I'm going to eat up out of this boat first before you do. Sure. And then, then that's where the fighting happens. That's where it's almost you abandon this sort of uh, brotherhood or that yes. place where you can right. see like, hey, here are all these connections that we have. It doesn't erase anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make um, the his history go away or anything, mm -hmm. but it potentially um, opens up a way for us to move forward mm -hmm. together. Um, which because there's an corny, obligation. No, it's not corny at all. There's an obligation. When you are trained and raised properly, yeah. you get out of the boat first. What do you do? You turn around and help the other guy out of the boat because both of you can't climb out of the boat at the same time. So that is human nature, yeah. actually, to do that, Absolutely. to turn back and go, oh, Absolutely. hey, brother, oh, you guys need some help? I, I got some gators on. I can get in the water. That is human nature. You have to actually suppress human nature to do that to you know, it's like serial killers, when they start hurting animals, that's your first sign because yeah. it's against human nature for a child to hurt a dog yeah. or a puppy or a cat. So when you turn around and say, oh, well, those babies in the water, I don't know those babies, they're black, so I'm just going to not pay any attention. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it, you have to actually suppress something in your own human nature to think that way. That's why, for me, it's a kind of form of child abuse or an expression of child abuse. So when I see those other people, yes, I want you to be like, okay, baby, back up off me yeah. now. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. And more importantly, not what's wrong with you. What happened to you? Yeah. What happened to you to have it that a black baby in the water has no value to a, 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 a Mexican baby floating in the Rio Grande, having crossed, that the cruelty is the point and you would go to a rally even though, oh, it's because you, you never saw anything about the Nazi Germany rallies or that these other places where people would decide those people are cockroaches, and they're not worthy. That is, you just see what I'm saying? Yeah. You are actually going against everything that is designed in a human being, tribally, to help others, and to trade with people who are not your tribe. Exactly. Right? Oh, you all cook it that way? Mm -hmm. Oh, do you use this kind of sauce? Oh, man, yeah. that looks yeah. good, but here, try this. And they put that on, and you go, shoot, yeah. man, uh -huh. this is the shit. I got mm -hmm. to take this back home mm -hmm. and, and take Absolutely. this spice back to my other. That is how we got ahead. Yeah. So it's that artificial suppression that therefore there's um, 
one, one of the, the leaders of our, uh, in, our, uh, in our artistic studio, Gray Williamson, has an expression that my humanity is not negotiable in increments, meaning that my closeness to you or distance from you is not how you get to decide whether I'm going to be fully accorded the rights of a human being or not because of your normalcy and your opinion of whether I have it automatically. We, are, we come into the world born as, as full potential, right? You, have, you stuff out that genius in a child who's from Guatemala at your peril, not ours. You decide that that person's life is expendable because they come in here to get our jobs, and then you let $10 billion of crops rot in the field, you're going to pay for that. You go to the market, and all of a sudden a head of broccoli is $9. You're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for the downstream stuff that's just like, oh, I don't really care if they poison the river down there. I don't live down there. It's like, dude, guess what? They're going to cycle that right back to you at some point. They're going to put in the food, put in the fish, put it in something, and you're going to be eating it sooner or later. And I think there's a generation that's awake to that shared prosperity yeah. and shared prospect, I think. Yeah. That's, uh, that's my hope. Yeah, it's... Um yeah, what the, what you're saying illustrates it so well because people, specifically people who are not in the elite class, but people who are sort of under that mm -hmm. upper middle, whatever you want to call it, um, oftentimes are afforded the the cosmetics that go with um, the elite class. Mm -hmm. They don't actually have the realistic pull or the realistic power, but you get a small, it's like a surf, you know, you get a small little teeny version of that sure. so you can have that little rush right and you want to keep that rush sure you want to have that little feeling of oh yeah well my kid goes to blah 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 oh, yeah we you know, we frequent this or we blah, blah. Mm -hmm. i drive this or i whatever and anything that you can do or that people could seem to do to distance themselves and create uh uh it's like people can only have value relative to other people do you know any wealthy people yes are they all happy no right yes that proves that yeah. you, know, you say no more, yeah. right? <laughs> if, if, if that alone, now it can convey a certain amount of ease. Certainly, I'd rather have $200,000 to throw at a problem than only $200 left to yes. throw at a problem. So that can create a certain amount of ease. But I know uh, a lot of wealthy people who are extremely unhappy. I know a lot of people who are just doing all right. You cannot suppress. They get up every morning, zippity-doo-da, and they're about their day, right? So that alone can't do it. And I think that there's something to also investigate behind, like how is wealth attained? Because if you inherited it, and I ask what your grandfather did, ooh, now that gets uncomfortable real fast. Because yeah. it's almost always tied to some level of exploitation, isn't it? it of it, someone. It has know? to be. Women, minor, you know, oh, we send our products over there. It's like, what do you pay for them when you go to send their products to Cambodia? Oh, $9 a week. A week? Well, is a fish a dime? No. It costs a dollar a day for a fish. Yeah. So, and he's got a family of four? Or you never cared about to find out? You see what I'm saying? So exploitation is the enemy, not, not racially, not just your race. Exactly. Because uh, black people exploit each other, and brown people exploit each other, and Asian people exploit each other. Because the elites always want to be the elite. They get to be elite because, no, I'm over here. You're yeah. over there. Mm -hmm. You're down there. Mm -hmm. And that's something that if we could begin to investigate that with people, like what is enough? Does every, oh, you know, do you, does everyone need to live in a 9,000 square foot house? Like everybody has to have their own room. There's four of you and you live in a 48,000 square foot house. Really? You have to have that? Because that's an awful lot of resources going to one. And this guy has to have a tiny house. That's, he's got to be satisfied with that. Um, so it's, it's, uh, there are things that I think that we can really trouble because there are problematic things about how much do we need in a world that, yeah, we can consider ourselves on the top of it because we can consume 35% of the world's resources, but boo, all of the fish are eating <laughs> plastic now. You know and, what I'm saying? So it's going to be a problem. It's, it's really All what the fish are eating plastic. And the more you educate yourself on how the world works, is the more scared you get by the, how much we consume. Sure. Like I, I don't remember when people was like recycle. I don't care. I, I don't care nothing about what y'all talking about recycling. Mm -hmm. Why? For mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. 
until I went on a trip to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, right. until we pulled out the water sample, I seen right. what the harbor water versus sure. the upstream, sure. and then somebody broke it down to me. Right. And they said, okay, this is the downstream effects of how it affects the air quality. Yep. And, and Everything. then I'm like, oh, I got asthma. Right. See, you got to, um, people need an access point, we were mm-hmm. talking about, of which they can now relate to that problem. Sure. And a lot of these um, problems or issues that um, people who lean t- more towards a progressive thing can be uh, put in the scope that does not, that doesn't include black and brown people. Mm-hmm. It's, or, or only includes a version of black and brown people. Yeah, it doesn't what really that, even include them then. It's like, you can entertain me or you can handle the party, you can decorate my scene. But uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like, you know, people tell you, it's like, I've had five black people in my house. And I heard a comedian say, well, if you know exactly how many black people have been in your house, like, that's racist as shit. Okay, that's so funny. it is because it's true. Like, you can count them, you know exactly how many have been there. But I think that, uh, you know, the reason why, I mean, there's, there's certainly cause for um, concern. Yeah is cause for even um, pessimism about it. I choose to remain optimistic because I'm always looking for genius. I'm always looking for someone to surprise me. And I've learned from the businesses that I've been involved in because I've mostly been in the arts business and the arts business that's transferable into the development business that you know somebody is always gonna say something amazing and you just don't know where it's gonna come from. Now, if you're only saying, well, that doesn't matter because you work, blah, 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 blah. These are the people I hired to be amazing. And this person could be the key to your whole enterprise. And they're telling you, that yeah, it doesn't work. I'm trying to tell you it doesn't work because I have to use it every day. It's like, well, yeah, but that doesn't matter because you don't have a PhD. Uh, and then that's the thing. And what do we see? It's called the normalization of deviance, right? What do we see always? The thing that crashes it down is a ring or a thing or a screw that got stripped. And somebody said, hey, you know, that screw won't bear that kind of pressure. It was like, who, you're just a mechanic. I'm the PhD. You just be quiet. We're going to just keep doing that. And the ping, and the whole thing crashes. We know this to be true. So that's and, and we, part of what it, we have to change. And we somehow just, not we, but, but a majority of people not even necessarily um, agree, but don't fight against or don't maybe don't know how to fight against the systems that keep on crashing. Sure. Like we know they crash. That's hard. They say, "Hey, we're the smartest. We running this." Right. But y'all are always crashing. Right. How are y'all the smartest? But every four to eight years, sure. y'all are crashing. Every single time, there's yeah. a bubble. Y'all. You pop. have to. You have to figure out at some point. We all do. Um, who's benefiting from it crashing? Exactly. Who's benefiting from um, a uh, uh, rate, the rates, the current rates of incarceration? Who benefits from that? A lot of people benefited. A lot of people, a lot of jailers, builders, toilet paper companies, all the rest of that benefit from those systems, even though at the end of the day, we know that really it doesn't benefit us as a society, which is why now they're like, well, we don't really need to be keeping nonviolent people in prison for 25 years for selling weed when you're about to make pot barons out of these people over here for doing what? Selling weed. These people, those people didn't jump into the business yesterday. They've been in, in the business of growing and manufacturing and distributing marijuana for a generation, right? But these people went to jail for 40 years, and now this person has a pristine record because that never leapt over the, mm. the, the, you know, the Rio Grande and got to them. And so now they're going to be making $30 million a quarter net profit, and these people are going to come out and maybe be able to get a job you know, bagging groceries. Mm. So that is not a huge thing unless you are telling me, don't worry about that. Don't worry about recycling. That doesn't have anything to do with you. It doesn't affect you at all. Once, one, you know, these things. That's for somebody else to worry about. Yeah. You ever have somebody sit, tell you, "I'm not trying to know all that stuff." All of my friends. <laughs> I'm not trying <laughs> like, to know all that. Man. All of it's my like, friends, yeah. and I and I understand because you you've been programmed to think that it doesn't matter, and even if it did matter, it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't matter to you. Right. It matters it to everyone. You. Somehow right. you're separate. Sure. You're in a cubicle over to the left and right. everybody else is profiting or not profiting mm-hmm. from it and no matter what your life is your life I'm gonna go out here I'm gonna do whatever I got to do I'm, blah, 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 mm-hmm. I'm gonna go home yeah um, and something that you that you were talking about yeah something you're talking about you know I the moment I realized what you said was I was uh, working at um, an investment bank and I was 
basically had to work overnight. Mm -hmm. And this was during Brexit. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember like everybody freaking out. I have family over there. Half of my family lives over in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I remember Snapchatting them and texting them and mm -hmm. WhatsApping them and asking mm -hmm. them what are their opinions. And they're stressing out. They don't know what's going to happen because mm -hmm. everything was it was up in the air, similar sure. to the Trump election. Right. Um, and uh, I remember me having conversations with uh, my traders and people that I was uh, assisting and helping, whatever, mm -hmm. in total different tone, mm -hmm. especially the more seasoned ones. Mm -hmm. It was a an air of um, preparation, an air of, yeah, I got this and this, this, this. And then so I watched as certain individuals and heard online and other ways about people who, in there's a guy who made in nine minutes $30 million mm -hmm. off of a thing that was to everyone a negative thing. Sure, right. And I said, oh, so this is what I've heard people say, there's money, somebody, where's the money, somebody making money? Because it's like somebody's betting on it happening mm -hmm. and on it not happening. happening. Right. On you and winning they may cover and both losing. sides. And, right. and they exactly. might split there. If That's they're right. smart, they right. might hedge and, sure. and bet on both. Sure. Um, and so what I think my generation now is realizing, it's really actually kind of scary, is that there is little to no... And you, you please disagree um, if you do, but there will there's becoming an increasingly little amount of value in actually owning things. Mm -hmm. The system is making it so that is no value in owning things. There is value in shaving off a percentage from a transaction, mm -hmm. from it happening, or owning a piece of something. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I said that is because I was listening to a podcast, and I used to be a sneakerhead. I used to buy sneakers all the time, mm -hmm. but I bought them to wear them because mm -hmm. I was trying to floss, mm -hmm. trying to slant, whatever. And I spent all my money mm -hmm. on sneakers. Then mm -hmm. one day I got rid of them. And I was in a podcast and they were talking about, yeah, um, there's this app, there's a company that's wildly popular where you no longer um, own sneakers. You own a percentage of a sneaker because there is no value. I'm not, I'm not laughing really, but it's, it's, that's kind of funny. It's, yeah, I, I was like, first I was like, oh, this is, Dumb. This is the. I mean, dumbest. I guess fractional owner of a, ownership of an airplane, mm -hmm. but sneakers. Okay, that's that's. So this, the pair of sneakers were twenty thousand dollars, and really? yeah, absolutely. The ones that were made for seven dollars. Yeah. Okay. The, but this is back to the conversation we sure. talk about of real right, cost right, right. and value right. and who's Relative value. making right. those sneakers and who's right. saying that these sneakers are worth whatever. Sure. And people are paying to own seven percent in a twenty thousand dollars sneaker. That was made for seven dollars. That nobody can ever wear. That no one can ever wear mm -hmm. because maybe one day it'll be sold for thirty, mm -hmm. and I'll get a piece of the profit. Right. Well, <laughs> I don't disagree with you because uh, I think that, uh, like P.T. Barnum said, there's a sucker born literally every minute, um, <laughs> and that if in fact you could create value, you remember Yu-Gi-Oh cards? Yeah. Okay, so there was a I kid in my world who just would go bananas, yeah. and just because one of them was shinier than the other mm -hmm. ones, or this one had a dot on it, and so forth and so on, and so we, that's why we came up with the term shiny shit, right? So it's like, dude, if I can actually get you, if you think you're going to make me go nuts and spend $40 for a piece of cardboard with some shi shiny shit on it, I'm not gonna do that. So, you know, love you like I do, that's not what's gonna happen. And because I also know I can go into your room and see the same thing on, what was the other one? Was you, before Yu-Gi-Oh, there was Pokemon. something, yeah, Pokemon, uh -huh. right? That you have whole collections of Pokemon that you got your mother, because that was before I met him, to spend uh, like hundreds of dollars, you had the case, the thing, and blah, blah, blah. And that is always there, right? People can convey relative value, not on, like I understand the relative value between a Mercedes Benz and, uh, and, a, and a Ford Escort, because of the engineering that goes into the car. but. If you're telling me you're going to not pay your mortgage to have that, I was like, are you planning on living in there? Does it fold out with cots in it? Because you'll be sleeping in that. And then this person is going to work in this because they both still drive down the road. So you always want to investigate those kinds of things because value is kind of relative. Um, but the point about whether owning things is important now, people have always found a way to manipulate the, uh, the uh, lack of information of other people, creating scarcity and so on and so on. You know, those, those, are, those are old models. You know, I'm hoarding it and therefore this is the only one and you must pay blah, blah, blah for that. It was like, why? 
So it's the why that is also present in our children because we allowed you to ask those questions where in my generation you get popped in the mouth by asking why. Yeah. So that's already a big change. My daughter could ask why when she was four years old. And she was only because she was, you know, freaking out about something. And I was like, what is it? Don't I almost always give you the two? Yeah, well, what, what is it? So don't whine. Negotiate. What is it you want? So I sent her back to the shelf and told her, get all of it you can carry. And she was like, what? I said, all, whatever it was, toy, candy, whatever. I said, get everything you can carry, bring it to me. I said, oh, we're buying this. Eyes lit up. I was like, don't you ever whine to me again. Now, if you want something and I say, okay, I've heard your argument. Your argument doesn't work. It goes back on the shelf. But you're like, daddy, can I have? And I was like, sure. Did you clean up your room? Yeah, sure. Let's take it. And so from that point, now, why did I teach her that? Because everything became a negotiation after that. But it was, I was trying to insert something in her, in her brain about investigating the information and learning how to communicate and get your needs met. You don't need a toy. You don't need candy. But if you want it, like, I love you. Of course you can have it. So we want our young people to actually wow. be able to dig in for the things they really, quote unquote, need and distinguish them from wants. You don't have to have a Mercedes Benz to get to work. It makes you feel better. It's certainly, but a, a brand new escort will get you there, right? So it's when you put those things on the table and ask them to choose because there's going to be an argument for one or the other, what you don't want is the unconsciousness. I have to have the sneaker because why? Why do you have to have it? You're never going to wear it. Like what, what is its real value in the world? Not to depress you or to take joy out of your life. It's just like, really? Sneakers? I didn't know that. That's, that's, that's curious. I'd rather spend $20,000 and buy another house and get started on that because that's what lights me up. Maybe houses don't do anything for you. So that's, you know, it's, it's literally yeah. relative. But the sense of not needing to own anything anymore, there could be a value in that. Maybe we need more uh, cooperative things. Not for sneakers. Let's say something of value. Yes. Maybe, there, maybe I don't need to have three cars. Maybe I have one car. And I'm, my office is at home, and so when I'm not using it, as long as you help me pay for the insurance and blah, 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 I can share that vehicle. Don't wreck it. Don't mess it up. Don't give it to me with no gas in it. So there's, there might be a value in looking at more cooperative living and more shared prosperity. Yeah. Like on our, our blocks, do I really need 20 Escalades? Do I need everybody to have a Lincoln Aviator? Not really. You know why? No place to park. And you're all not going anywhere anyway. I see er, and er, and then you're back. So clearly you didn't need, you know, you know, a 19-foot vehicle. Um, so I think some of those things that really are, this is enough for me and my family to take care of myself, plus some put away, of course, for rainy days. But when my next-door neighbors live nine to a house, and there's 10 empty houses on my block that are rotting, that is not good for me. So even if it's just enlightened self-interest, that's just not good for me, um, for them to be over there, stuffed in there. Grandparents, parents, grandchildren, stuffed in the house, knowing all of them are living off of the, you know, just crumbs from the table of joy. You know, just, just nothing. Eating, maybe, not eating occasionally. So the 15-year-old in there got my eye on him because it was like, um, if he's not eating, He's going to pretty much figure out there's more to be gained from being on Pennsylvania Avenue than uh, washing windows because they're after him. So we begin to think about what our communities are like and more what the village needs and so forth and so on. I can't really be happy if Mrs. Johnson is not eating or doesn't get out anymore. Mm. So I th I, I'm hoping that that kind of thought process is that we are each other's keeper, brother and sister, and that... And once I have enough, as we used to, these are not, these are not new principles. Exactly. I've got a whole basket of tomatoes. Uh -huh. I've canned all I'm going to can. I've made all the sauce I'm going to can. And tomato bushes, as you know, they just keep putting them out. It's like, anybody on this block like tomatoes? I have enough. And we used to do that all the time. Yeah. And that's how we got off the plantation and into the world that we're in. I had a, two things, because I have one statement and then I have a question. Mm -hmm. So when you just said that I, had a, uh, I was at a restaurant, and I was about to take it to go. I always take it to go and give it to somebody. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't eat it, whatever, sure. I'm trying to diet, right, it don't right, matter. Right, right. I would take your food, somebody else want to throw their food, put it sure. all, boom, we're going to take it. Right. And um, the 
the waitress or whoever it was looked at me kind of funny. She mm -hmm. was like, um, all of it? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. yeah. So my girlfriend was like, um, oh, yeah, some of this for the dog. Oh, for the dog? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. I said, do you rather? And anyway, so that made me think of that. Um, but the other thing, the story you told, the importance of you giving um, your daughter the notion that she has the right to uh, negotiate, argue or, yeah, her case, right, right. like even if it's a no, sure, it's it's okay, right. it's a no, right, it's fine, right. But the but the practice of you invest like that's so important, and not to get on a soapbox, but it's so important for our children mm -hmm. because I know how valuable it was for me to go to a school that was constantly <laughs> brainwashing me mm -hmm. to question everything, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, really, I came out on the other end not believing that much different, but sure. having a stronger understanding and a stronger belief in whatever it was that I right. just kind of picked up right. out, of, out of habit or out of generationally or what, or what mm -hmm. have you. Um, so what kind of what drove you to have that thought process? Was Actually, how you it was, were raised? It, was, no, oh, it wasn't so much how I was raised, although we had a certain amount of freedom when we were little. Uh, my parents were not particularly religious or particularly political. And so, and if you ask my father a question even now, he'll give you a long, drawn-out bullshit answer because it's basically saying, go look it up. Like, I know. I'm this age much older than you. And after a while, I was like, oh, he's basically just telling me to go look it up. So I learned to look things up. And that was a value that I wanted to pass on to my daughter. But really, she taught me this because um, the, I also have a very quick temper. And uh, one day I said something, I turned on her a little bit more harshly than I intended to, and I saw her face just kind of crumble, and I was like, oh, no, 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 let me stop. That's how people sometimes raise me. And I do not want you to think that I'm not interested in your question or just you should do it because I said so. Sometimes you do. Like sometimes she'll know the difference in tone is like, Question time is over. It's time for you to just do that. <laughs> and I would actually try to relay those lessons to her in interesting ways. Like, baby, clean up your room. I'm going to do it. When? Uh, tomorrow. Okay. Baby, your room's still messed up. Are you going to clean up your room? Oh, I'm going to do it. When? Tomorrow. Okay. I want your room clean. Okay, yeah, I'm going to do it. Saturday. I'm going to the party. Nope, you ain't going nowhere. Why? What are you saying? It's room cleaning day. And so I found that by delaying the consequence a little bit and knowing that, she, that I understood, now this is already past the, you get to argue your point, now, now daddy has a point. The point is, you can go to the party, but this is now room cleaning time. Because you, t I didn't say, clean up your room, you must do it right now. And that was a little difference in our house sometimes. It's like, no, you tell me when you're going to do it, wow. and I'm just going to listen for that and go, that's cool with me, so you're going to do it. But if you're not going to be your word, then we have to hold each other accountable for that kind of stuff. And she flipped the script on me one time because I was telling her, we're going to go. She said, yeah, we're going to go unless the phone rings. I was like, you know, oh, shit. Yeah, so it's because you're going you're going to prioritize that phone over us going to the playground. And so I said, okay, you got me on that one. So yeah. you ever see that again? Go, Daddy. It doesn't matter what it is. Just do the phone. And it's over. It's like, sorry, my daughter needs me. Got to go. Yeah. And so... It was just recognizing, and I was very blessed to be in a community of people who, you know, I'm not a non-hitting parent. Never, my child's never had a spanking. Don't <laughs> believe in spanking because I think we learned to beat our children on the plantation, yeah. right? So I want all that to end. But I also know that when you when you spend a lot of time with children, and I do, I like love kids, that they're absolutely genius at that level. And you don't want to do anything to suppress that genius. And so what's the best way? to elicit the genius of a child. Once they, everything that we know how to do occurs in language. And so you have to be able to say, well, why do you want it? I just want it. Okay, but are you hungry? No. So let's, let's pull that out because the same thing later on can be used to interrogate other things that people are saying. Well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I don't really think that's true. And I watched her do that at five and six and seven years old, saying, I really want to check that out. And so then you don't have to be there when they're going, when someone says, here, try this. This is going to be good. What is it? Uh, don't worry about it. It's going to be good. Uh, what is it? Mm -hmm. 
And so you watch those things emerge in the intellect mm -hmm. of very young people if you don't squash it. Yeah. So our job as parents is to not squash your genius and then provide, you know, like in bowling gutters, like I don't want you to, I don't want to, I don't have to, I don't, I don't want to have to take you to the morgue to get you to realize what will happen if blah, blah, blah. And I don't want you to, I don't want to have to monitor every boy or every friend that comes in the door. These are the gutters. If the boy doesn't bring you home at 11, please tell him his parents will never see him again. And if you're going to go over there, please go there because when you call me to say something bad happens, I'm going to head someplace. And if you haven't told me where you're going, so you want that logic to be in the mind of that child. You want that logic to be in the mind of a coworker. We, are not, we don't slap coworkers that we disagree with, right? Nope. So why do we beat our children? Why do we slap them in the face in public when they say things, when they say no? And I've watched people do that to children, and it's, it's just not good. It's interesting because, you know, all I'm, not all, but a, a lot of what I'm hearing is um, an emphasis on building people up to be autonomous. Always. Um, and that is something that isn't immediately monetarily valuable for a lot of what people believe the way to make money is. People think, okay, you got to be dumber than me so I can pay you less, right? And you cannot believe in yourself and you can be finally getting paid less. You never, ever question me. Mm. You never question why. You don't, don't worry about it. You just flip, whatever. Do what you do. Cool. We're good. But then when the crash happens or when the thing goes up in flames, the manager or whoever it is is mad. Mm -hmm. And you can't get mad because you only taught that person how to do what they do. So when the thing was lighting up, they, they hear you. In their mind saying, don't touch that thing. Right. Don't you ever touch sure. it in your life. Right. Even though if they touched it, it right. would have saved your whole business. I think history has taught us over and over again. You ignore, because almost always, we're always warned. We're always been told in the beginning. And someone says, ah, oh, that's not important. It's like, I think it is, but okay. And so when, you're, when you have those systems of complete dominance, either I have all the information you don't, or I have all the intellect and you don't. I have all the feeling or the intellect or, or the intuition about something and you don't. It's that sense of that I have it and you don't that is proved over and over and over again throughout all of history that that is completely a ridiculous and specious argument after a while. It's like uh, there's almost always a warning. Yeah. Almost always. I mean, even, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, yeah. floods, we always know. Yeah. Like, uh, we're going to be eating plastic in <laughs> plastic fish. I'm sorry to, to jump no, on here. But, but I'm saying that those things that are right. in the water that you're we right. actually, we've been warned. Yeah. Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in like 61. Yeah. That was a long, long time ago. And then since then, we've had Love Canal and, yeah. you know, Chernobyl and all these other things. Mm -hmm. It's like we ignore those things at our collective peril. Um, I think when I was looking at this, uh, a heat map for pollution in California, like 25% of it blew over from China in California because it's a slipstream. It goes right across the Pacific and lands in that smog in California. And we breathe that and incidences of asthma go through the roof. It's the same in Baltimore. Yeah. You know, so the, uh, the, 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 the amount of environmental degradation in the houses where people live is extreme. And when you, not, when you go and see all those bulldozers just knocking down stuff, do you see all that enveloped in a giant blanket of, well, we may, must keep this contained? Or do they knock those bricks down and spread that right into the community? Because you know why? The cancer won't show up for 10 years. So we really need to understand that about how uh, proximity has both values, upside and a downside. But... I can't help you if you're like, oh, it's white people over there. I don't really care about them. Or those people are, you know, they, they were born that way. I literally had a lawyer the other day. I asked her, well, why do immigrants come to America and buy into the racist fantasies about black people and so forth and so on? They have to then start to be a part of this elite. And she didn't quite answer the question. She was really on the, well, it's, you know, personal responsibility. You should learn to ignore that and, and go ahead. I was like, no, these things are encoded in the law. I'm not talking about whether... I answer to white people saying mean things to me. I don't. And I was like, you, you do that at your peril. There's a physical threat because you're in my personal space. And then B, I don't answer to any of that. Yeah. But if you can encode something in the law that keeps me confined to this thing, that's not a feeling. Yeah. That's not uh, just a yeah. little, 
they're being yeah. mean to me. It's encoded in the law. Yeah. So we need to look at those places where the people that we, we think are supposed to be on our side, yeah. teachers, firemen, and people we pay to actually provide a certain thing who target our next generation of assets and go, no, you're going to be destined for failure. How do you know? You tell the story all the time about Einstein not speaking until he was six. How do you know? I see that you suppress genius everywhere, right? It's not like they're just going, oh, all the white kids in the class are going to yeah. do well, because they're turning on each other, as we've seen, with ferocity. Absolutely. But you, when you all agree that these people will not get ahead, you got, we have to we really, the, the benefit of this moment is that all of us, our young, our old, the people in the middle, the people who are still working, who one day have to push my wheelchair, if I ever have to be in one, their agency matters now. Their intellect, their capacity, their freedoms matter to me now because I'm closer to that than I am closer to kindergarten. So, I, I, I mean, I'm not good at math, but I'm not good. I can count, right? So I think that that's really the power of the moment that we are, that in this city particularly, I think it matters. Baltimore is small to more. It's about the same size as Harlem. When I lived in Harlem, I didn't live in all of New York City. I lived in Harlem. And I knew people, just like you can find people that you see frequently in frequent spaces in, in Baltimore, that was, in previous generations, a part of the problem. It was separated by two inches, but it was 20 miles deep. You cross over in the sundown. You, you in Hamden in the, in the 70s, you could be, we, we, we would have a problem after dark, Absolutely. right? We could, be, we could be in big trouble Absolutely. in certain neighborhoods. Now, there's a value to it, but if the value, if the, if the re-engineering of the split becomes only economic, we're in this kind of mix, and the rest of them shall not eat, how long do you think we'll figure out that they should just climb over the wall and it, eat us? It's, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? How us. long would that take for them? It's like, well, those, those people seem to be doing okay. They got gold chains and cars. Let's go and break in their cars. There, 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 there is no version of our world that exists in which you're going to hoard every you're not you cannot protect you can't yeah. hoard everything and protect it right it's people going to aim for you it's an interdependent world and it always has been yeah. it's just that now we, now we really see it yeah. so that's i think uh both the the challenge every generation must have its challenge and that's the uh and that's the value proposition that i feel that we've arrived at the place where a, you, you can't tell a child they can have a cookie and the next day they can't have it. They will tell you that's not fair. That's the first thing out of their mouth at three. That's, that's not fair. Well, why is it fair that you can choke a guy to death and get off and then exonerate him and then he can go work on another police force and go and do that when in fact choking a person to death over loose cigarettes that he wasn't even selling that day is grossly unfair and unjust. So it won't be long before the pendulum, you know, the, the, the old adage, and then they came for me. It comes for you. White women, it will come for you. White guy who's got a beard that the guy doesn't like, it will come for you. And so that's why a shared prosperity, a shared outcome matters the most because you want those systems. They must be just or you don't. It's like justice is everybody has it or nobody has it. And those are not new, but it's Martin Luther King and people before him and people before him. You know, th these are truisms that are handed down over the ages. It's probably Euripides or somebody yeah, yeah. said it. You know what I mean? That if, if, it's not, if, if it's not something that everybody has access to, then it actually you never have it. So all this um, crisis that we're in about the Constitution is like, well, what did you think was going to happen when you were screwing slaves at night and coming and writing about freedom during the day? What did you think was going to happen when all of your systems are based on enslavement and kidnapping and murder and mayhem and theft? So you can't actually write lofty words about those things without going, wow, this really happened. So let's start from here and plan 100 years from now on having a just system because we have to do some repair of the damage if all of that is based on theft and a lie. Like, not some, all of it based on theft and a lie. And people are really uncomfortable when you say stuff like that. They, they, I, had a, I had a drive, I was driving up to New York and I had a drive back and um, drive through Jersey. And I had a conversation with a um, girlfriend. She was talking about how she was on this trip uh, and she's getting her master's or whatever. And, and people were talking about 
some some uh, sort of uh, equity conversation happened, and people were talking about the old thing of my family, you know, first generation immigrants from this country, and, and here with a shirt on our back, with and the, blah, yeah, blah, and we blah, 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 everything blah. we whatever bootstraps, and everybody got straps and all the straps, right? Um, and so she was asking me, um, or we were just sort of having a conversation about uh, what exactly uh, are or were. Is the, what's the truth behind that, right? Is that real? Is it not real? Mm. And it's exactly what you said. I just said, look, the whole system was already set up for you to come in, and there were advantages to being a certain character. It's like mm -hmm. playing a video game. If if you are playing a video game, and the option of the, and the the goal of the game is to be fast, and you naturally are fast, you come in that game, you want to smoke. Mm -hmm. It don't matter whether or not you ever played it before. Mm -hmm. Right. You automatically come in and boom, you're killing it. Why? Because you fit the narrative of the advantage. Mm -hmm. And so then you play into that more. You want, and, and it makes so much sense when you look at, like you're saying, it was encoded mm -hmm. because this is why people try to lighten up their race or lighten up their family sure. line or whatever because you're doing anything you can to reach back and they get, anglicize their names. They drop it off. You're not, you're not, you're not. Jebediah or yeah. now Jerry, right? Yeah. So there's, there's, that is the natural inclination in terms of assimilating into the norm. You clearly know when you get here that whiteness has a value because, you know, Irish were, uh, and Italians and Poles were, eh, and then they drop those other things in their names and then all of a sudden well, you join the magical world of whiteness and yeah. it's a kind of a magical world, really. Yeah. You know, so no one is trying to burn out your Polish market, and because you only you're pull out you only pull out your roots when you're trying to tell somebody that you ain't that just you, that you're a little bit interesting. You don't, you don't, and you don't have you don't really have privilege because you yeah. earned that mm -hmm. because it does require suppression of the other story yep. to figure out well who was in that who was living in Central Park when you made it Central Park who did Georgetown used to belong to which was a slave port. Where did these neighborhoods suddenly become like the places that, well, we have to be there. Was anybody there? Yeah, well, there were people there, but, you know. And then one of the number one crops in America is actually timber, not cotton. People used to live under those trees. And they didn't pay for any of that land or the trees that grew on it. So if you talk about wow. a country becoming fabulously wealthy, if I come in and take all of your resources and claim I discovered it because, well, you don't really matter, because you should actually just, now that I'm here, you should move. Um, it is not a long time ago. As we afford everybody else who've been harmed as like, well, what do they tell you? Never forget. We're just supposed to stop talking about it. So you have to actually stop that conversation because that is a fiction. Yeah. It's a lie that does no one any good. It creates the ability to go, well, they're just, they just, they're lazy. Yeah. They just should work a little harder and they shouldn't, smoke so much weed and they shouldn't do blah 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 so forth and so on. It's like wait a minute, just like let's let's kill off all the stupid conversations. Yeah. And you'll have a rough night because you're gonna absorb this enormous history yeah. of rape, murder, yeah. theft, pillage, anything you want to name. Yeah. Right? And then sometime in the future we're gonna go, sure glad how do you have reconciliation without truth? And we don't yet have the truth. They make themselves the heroes in our story. And you and I can't make a movie unless we look around and go, well, who's the white guy? Because if we don't have a white guy, we don't have a movie. It's almost very difficult to be able to do, tell our, our, yeah. the stories of our own heroics with our, with our, within our own families without that thing. Now, that is, I think, going to change a little bit. But I have a warning, and this is just an old person talking. You have to be careful about culture because it is easily uh, manipulable because it's storytelling. So in my generation, we had love songs growing up. And I see a generation without almost any. I see a generation, when I ask these young people, it's like those lyrics I hear you going down the street, would you say them out loud? Oh man, you, know, you don't want to hear that, Mr. Andre. It's like, I actually do. Because I want to know, would you sit at your grandmother's table and say the stuff that I hear you going, get to the big, get 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 get
you want them to memorize that? Like, that's our song that we're going to talk about 50 years from now? We have to be careful about culture and how manipulable it is. We were just talking about how, you know, I, don't, I hate to say it, but we could say the elite powers that be, whatever, are very, find out what's valuable and then c convince everyone else right. that it's not valuable. Make it come out, right. Yeah. Make it come out yeah, of the yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you don't want it. Uh, no, yeah. uh, music, uh, whatever. Sure. Songs, uh, yeah, uh, right. Your masters, uh, copyright, no, no, don't worry about it. Right. We got this. We got this. Here's some money. Sure. Do your thing, buy a car, whatever, buy your mama a house, boom. We're going to take this little bit of whatever ownership, mm -hmm. with percentages, sure. and don't matter, splits. Right. Who knows? Old game, right? Right? It's Old the, it's the same. game. And, right. and, um, that, but like you were saying, there are pockets of um, uh, portions of, of generations, my generation, other generations that are coming into the game, so to speak, starting from the level of, hey, I'm not going to fall for that trick. Yes. I might fall right. for a new trick. Right. Y'all going to have to work hard and figure out what right. the new trick is, that's whether right. that's streaming. Sure. Right. And all right. these other ways that they're able to circumvent and they think ahead or whatever. Sure. That's cool. But eventually I'm hopeful like you are that uh, the generations will wisen up quicker than the, than the corporation. I, the I think I, I already see them doing it. Can, that's why I remain hopeful. Yeah. I think we just have to be, we always want to be cautious about some of it, but I, I, I remain hopeful because generally I'm a hopeful person, but I see genius all over the place. You know, you only have to, I think, be a really good listener and it depends on what you're listening for. Um, but when you're a good listener, and I've tried to become a better listener, that's one thing else that my daughter taught me is to, you know, Daddy, you like, shouldn't talk so much. And I was like, mm, you're right. Um, and in that listening, and listening for, uh, even when they're struggling with something, like I may know something you don't know about something, but I would watch you, if I listened for your struggle on it, I was like, oh, that's a good struggle to have, because it took me 35 years to figure out what I think I know about that thing. But with you addressing it at your age, you should get to that in a third of the time that it took me. I hear my daughter wrestling with stuff. I was like, girl, you know how old I was before I figured out what you just told me at 25? So I think that's the natural order of things. I think that is the biological imperative. Young people are supposed to go, so what do you think about blah, 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 young man? And shut the hell up and have you tell me and go, hmm, that's interesting. Well, if that's so, what about this? Blah, blah, blah. It's not that I couldn't figure out some, well, let me just, you shut up and listen to me because I'm the holder of all wisdom. It is not that way. Young people are sometimes extremely wise and sometimes old people are really stupid about stuff. It just depends on what their experience is and whether they've ever listened to other people when they're trying to uh, share things with them. Um, we live in a share culture now and that has a value. Now, I'm not saying it's everything, because if I make a movie and you share it and don't pay for it, you are stealing from me, <laughs> right? But share culture says that, hey, just guess what I just saw? And you share that idea with other people and you have a trusted network out there, they're gonna go, well, maybe I should go and try to participate in that as well, because I don't care what a critic that I don't know says, but this dude has never steered me wrong. Absolutely. So you see what I'm saying? So that Absolutely. is a value in, in, in having those big broad networks that you, do, you can get to without having to drive there and be at Thanksgiving dinner. It's like, okay, I say, hey everybody, I'm not gonna be at Thanksgiving, but bang, here's, I love all of you. Yeah. And send it out to everybody. Absolutely. You know, I'm still sometimes, you know, having, you know, grown up before the internet going, wow, you know how much easier this is <laughs> now than it used to be? <laughs> how many, how much work I can do in many other places that I could never do before because yeah. you had to just, sit there on a mimeograph machine and all. I don't mean, like I said, I don't mean no, to be the no. old man on the mountain, yeah. but I'm just saying that I'm still enthusiastic but it's about but those changes. Um, it's, it's great, along with everything you're saying, the, the line of communication between generations is important because we're used to this. Mm -hmm. I don't know no different. Right. I only am exposed to how old I am mm -hmm. when I talk to my cousins mm -hmm. and I don't know what's who are happening. younger than you well, younger, yeah yeah right well only exactly. five to six years younger than me right 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 but live in a a separate universe sure. from me in terms of what's important 
what they're watching, what they're talking about, right. what the future really is, what type of music is cool. Like everything sure. is just different. Right. Um, and, and thankfully, so now I am in weird ways, in weird circumstances, the old man on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Because I already went to college. And you're not even 30 yet. Yeah, I'm 26. Okay. 26 years old. But I really am because my cousin's coming in. Go, my shoes on my belt are older than you. <laughs> I think it's my wallet actually that's older than you. But it's cool. It's cool. And, and they come to me and they go, oh, wow. So you blah, blah, blah. Oh, you did that? You were, uh, you remember when YouTube first came out? Yeah. You right. had a Facebook account when it right. first? <laughs> right. And I, but right. That, those are the milestones sure. of of progress of modern era, right. of modern era. it's actually like, cut down the length of time between the generations right because it used to be 25 years and now it's like 10 or 7 like for real um, and uh you know those those things still uh, they light me up yeah because you know when it's a blessing to be older and uh to be able because many of my friends are no longer with us yeah. and i'm starting to lose them you yeah. know at 65 on my next birthday i'm starting to lose friends um but when I look at those eras, yeah, it's like something is the each civilization is built on the shoulders or the backs of the old generation. You know what I mean? Something I went to Egypt a couple of years ago and I didn't had never been before, so you didn't realize that some of the temples that are five thousand years old are built on some that are seven thousand years old. And that's two thousand years and that is like squashed <laughs> under the sand. And this was like, well, what is that on? <laughs> That's all built on something else, yeah. and it's almost that way, yeah. right? Cities revive. Yeah. You, you, some things you have to make sure you're preserving, and some things like we have to be preservationists yeah. and futurists at the same time, which is a message I have often for my generation and older. You know, you you, you can talk about millennials all day long, but you know we used to be them. We we were in our twenties at some point, and we thought we were the shit. Mm -hmm. And when my brothers and I came home with afros, man, listen. You were, my father thought we had ended black civilization as he knew it. Wow. He was like, what is wrong? What, you all gonna keep wearing your hair like that? It's like, yeah, Dad, what do you mean? Cool, right? Clearly it didn't work out, <laughs> right? But, you know, when I, w I, but I grew up in an era where I also listened to the music that he listened to, yeah. right? So we had those kind of things in common. Yeah. So. I think that I've watched my daughter like ask for a record player. It's like, what do you want a record player? Yeah. You don't want a screen? It's like, yeah, I like vinyl. It's like, wow, okay. That's cool and interesting. Uh -huh. And then realizing not only did she have my whole old record collection, she had my dad's old record wow. collection. And is happy to have yeah. that because it's something, not only just because of us, because of what she found in, the, in that music of that era. So. Um, I don't know, man. I, I you know, I, I'm. I, I think that the place that we are, even though there's clearly a lot of work to to do, and there's not shared prosperity, and some of that's getting worse, right? But I think that what what I'm hoping to see unleashed in the young is a sense of, well, now we're free, right? Not so much religiosity, not so much this, not so much that, but can we? Um, go back and collect some of the things that we needed that we thought we didn't need and those are those end up being like these values quote unquote and it's not an imposed value it's a it's a discovered value in the midst of it and they discover oh that really is that and I like that and I'm, we're going to hold on to that because when you're in your 20s and 30s there's going to be children behind you even if they're not yours yeah. right they're um, with blended families, yeah. and you know, you marry somebody, yeah. they've got three kids, yeah. and so on and so on. But aren't all the children important? Aren't all the elders important? Yeah. I think there is enough to share, and I think that they will, will find a place where um, those other things that are just about sort of you know greed and avarice, and like we were talking about graft and so forth and so on. It's like this. It, it's a it's a gift to watch somebody try to stand in front of everybody, steal and go, no, I didn't do that. It was like, no, you did, actually. And you can't convince me. So, you did. Yeah, we uh, no. so we were talking about this before we were rolling, rolling. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, you mentioned that you are involved in arts and that kind of transitioned into real estate mm -hmm. and development. Mm -hmm. And how has it been uh, being a brown, black, 
developer, mm-hmm. owner um, in a neighborhood that uh, my mom also owns a house mm-hmm. up, up, up on the 20, 2100 block, mm-hmm. um, right up there. Uh, how has it been owning there? What led you to, and it doesn't, I mean, it could be whatever, whatever it is. It's, um, inter- I, it's been very difficult. Uh, Baltimore is a very difficult uh, place because <clears throat> capital is difficult here. Hmm. Capital is difficult for black people just about everywhere, right? Because um, we don't have long, deep, established systems of trust. And capital of any kind, social, human, or whatever, there, you know, it's like uh, uh, Stephen Covey's uh, uh, said it best, you know, those things move at the speed of trust. And our distrust with each other has been learned behavior, right? So in breaking that boundary, um, you see in a city like Baltimore, uh, and some of it is Groundhog Day for me because of having done uh, creative placemaking in a lot of other places. Like you go, we go to a place because artists are looking for cheap space. We find that cheap space and we light it up. People are coming, we need a coffee shop, we need a this, we need a that, and you light up that area. But if you're leasing, if you're renting, the landlord is easily able to say, wow, this is great over here now. It's action, things are happening at night, there's activity, there's a restaurant. <laughs> what are you guys making? $20,000 a month? Yeah. Oh, your new rent's 24000 yeah. And they kick you out because they don't literally need you anymore. So that's the landlord mentality, right? They're just extracting things from the environment. They, are, they don't live there. They don't live near you. They're just extracting. And they take all of that, all of the, your largesse goes to somebody else. Um, Every, every place, every other city around us has been uh, completely uh, gentrified, quote unquote, to, to borrow a little bit of that term, meaning that it's become unaffordable. Like when the market arrives, the market's unaffordable for everybody, yeah. right? And the market rate means that, yeah, you may have a six figure salary, but you're still going to pay 40% of your salary for my building that I own. Yeah. You're going to be paying me rent, right? Yeah. So that's a problem for you. Not for me. And if you have to have three roommates Uh at 28 or 29 to be able to live in that little, you know, $3,500 one bedroom apartment where you all sleep in shifts, problem for you, not a problem for me. So Baltimore is really one of the last places where you could actually do something about it. What's really difficult about Baltimore is those old historical contexts that say that we have the, we have the banks and we'll only loan it by the percentage of white people that live in your neighborhood. And we don't say that by, like, it's not written out that way anymore, but it's kind of encoded in practice that if, in fact, it doesn't really matter how much money I put into a house, if I don't own all the houses on the block, I cannot change the, the market rate on my block. Some, 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 um, someone's going to come and ass- they're going to be assigned by the bank to come and assess the value, and that value is always subjective. We could have all PhDs who live on that block, all of us black as tar, and it won't be the same as a high school block in Bolton Hills. And so if those things are factual and they're encoded in math and law, then our neighbors are not progressing, so therefore there is no justice, right? And so the the core thing is getting to a certain amount of economic justice. The other part of it, I believe, is also knowing which politicians are there to do. We're supposed to be writing agendas and give that to them and say, here's what's important to us, we the people. And on the surface of it, that's what's supposed to be so. It's done that way. And that is not the way most political systems work. Not in, a, not in this country. Not anywhere in the world, but particularly not here. They are very racialized systems. They are driven by uh, that uh, economic power is your vote, right? Doesn't really matter what all of us got together and say if I, as the wealthy developer, and say, I don't care what they said. Here's what we're doing. Yeah. Just keep that. That's for you. And I'm not saying everybody's crooked. Yes. I'm saying they have a voice because yes. that is a voice. Yeah. That's a vote. Um, and then what keeps what's really troubling about Baltimore is there's another layer under it that requires black complicity. And that's the biggest problem. Mm. That the people who are supposed to have the voice of the quote unquote community, there's about 10 of them yeah. in Baltimore. And they are sitting atop all of these quote-unquote neighborhood associations. They're supposed to be like 267 neighborhoods or whatever. But maybe six of them have any capacity whatsoever. So those six or ten who call themselves quote-unquote having capacity, 
are in league with all these other things because they inherited a system that was so broken that I could actually give you $20,000 and watch you turn on your neighbors with ferocity. And they don't know why the decision got made because they thought they weren't at the meeting, you were. And you said, well, this is going to be good for all of you because it's good for me. And if that is, that has to be approached as a level of corruption. And I'm not saying theft, I'm saying corruption. It's a social, it's a breaking of the social contract. And that's what's difficult, that when you look at these neighbors, these neighborhoods, in quote unquote the black butterfly, that are locked in poverty for three, four generations. Yep. When you get back to why they're locked in poverty, that's troubling. You have to ask, like, that was law, Absolutely. and that was practice, committed practice and law for a long period of time. So now we have these, these um, freedom of whatever acts, right, that come up. And they're going to pour a little bit of money in, as they did in 2015, right? Money flooded in. But it's just about over. What are we, five years out now? It's almost over. You know why? They gave it to those hands. First, white hands touched it exclusively, filtered it down to a few black agencies here or there, filtered down. And some of the people are taking a whack of that. That, that it would have, it, it's, The reason why they don't want us to talk about it, it's embarrassing. It's, it's, if you look at the cut they take, and how much, you ever been in any of these systems where people ask you, well, we need more data. Yes. We have to have more data. Yes. You have to turn in your data. We need metrics. We need data. It was like, you need more data than, than 12 colleges and universities and 14 foundations have already gathered because we know that it's really simple. Racism equals poverty. The end. And if your system is still involved in those racist practices, and I'm not talking about bigotry, I'm talking about racism. Many people can work in a racist system and not be bigots at all, right? Love every, oh, I don't see colors. Like, psh, then you're an idiot, because I do. And so well, how could you possibly actually mean that? I don't have any stigma attached to the colorism that exists in my community because I know where that colorism comes from. There's people who have black skin privilege and people who have brown skin privilege and light skin privilege because you can't tell them anything different than who, you can't tell them who they are not. They'll go, oh, I don't know who you are, but my dad told me I'm beautiful and they're going to just go on, right? So with that being so, though, we have squandered a bit of our intellectual resilience and our intellectual capital because you have a generation out there that cannot read because you didn't read to them. So therefore, that is an emergency because even the internet is still a reading environment. It's still an intellectual environment. You can write some stuff that has no sources and blah, 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 blah. People are going to go, eh, sounds, that sounds like complete bullshit. Yeah. So if that's so, the troubling thing in Baltimore is that people have sat there year after year, decade after decade, going back and over and over again, over and over and over again, running again like it's some beauty pageant. And we put them in again and put them in again because you're agreeing that a tiny minority who shows up in all those meetings, votes for all of you. And you're like, oh man, I ain't trying to go to all those meetings. I don't want to know all that. It's like, ah ha ha. You should be in there at some point or and, another. And that is, um, that's the American way, for it real. Is. Right. I mean, I used to, uh, I'm, I'm sure I used to anger and probably still anger all of my um, friends who are in the medical fields and the research field because I don't believe nothing they say. Mm -hmm. And not out of a, uh, like, I don't believe nothing they say. I mean that when they say research souls or whatever. I remember when we figured out what that means. We pulled a couple people, and they said, this applies to everybody. And we now know that that does not work. So it's fine. Just redefine what that means. Say, hey, we talked to 100 people from this specific neighborhood. neighborhood right. We saw this trend, right. and we are extrapolating that this might exactly be the right. case based on similarity sure. between these people and those right. people. And then we have to ask, well, why did you select that neighborhood? And who are those people that you talked to? Is the, did you poll them in the morning exactly. when everybody was at work? Exactly. I mean, all those things have For to real. be investigated. Yeah. And I don't mean investigated like I don't believe anything. Yeah. I, I want to know, like... I've seen, because I'm, I'm not good at math, I'm, I'm fascinated by mathematics, mm -hmm. right? So I've seen that manipulation happen over and over again. And so that lands in polling data, and that lands in these, and the, in the trends, and so forth and so on. And if I watch you watch a trend over and over and over again, but still keep 
publishing it year after year and getting another. I actually saw an organization come here, and they shall remain nameless, talk about doing a $20 million study on poverty in Baltimore. I was like, for what? For what? Yeah. Spend $5 million on mm -hmm. yourselves, go mm -hmm. have a party, give $15 million to two organizations that are doing the work on poverty, and then study the implementation of their change, there you go. of their solution. Yeah. That's don't, all you got to do. Don't, spend, don't yeah. study poverty anymore because all the rest of the foundations and all the universities have been studying it for generations. Yeah, so it, there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's a dishonesty. Yeah, it's like they're that substituting study. actual work. You're not, okay, I don't know, I got so many friends in the research community, sure. but you're not doing anything, you're doing part one, right, when you're doing research. Right. So if you have, like you're saying, if you got $20 million to spend, why are you spending $20 million on part one? Right. You're okay, I get it. You want to figure out the thing and boom, 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 whatever, okay. But if there are, like you're saying, already people that understand what is happening in reality, on the ground with real human beings mm -hmm. that exist outside of the room that you are in mm -hmm. and you can affect their, their lives and then look at that and then say, hey, in order for you to take this money, all you got to do is um, p get people to do this questionnaire mm -hmm. or whatever. And you can collect the data for free and then y'all go look at it after this. It's mm -hmm. almost like um, a term I learned, I can't remember what it is, but virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. And which is just like, okay, mm -hmm. we, we, we did it. We re we looked at it. We mm -hmm. looked at the numbers, and then it stalls. Sure. So then you got five years to play with that's, that you can take the heat off of you. Right. People saying, "Oh, what are you looking at?" It? And that's where I think that we are. That we are at a place where we need to look at that stall as a as a normal part of that process. Yeah. So the reason why I am uh, focusing on development, even though it's very difficult, yeah. is because I've been in other places that were already developed, and I lost in all of those places. As soon as we lit up the area, they kicked us out. Uh, I, my brother and I had an art gallery in Emeryville, California. Pixar expands across the street. My rent went from seven to twenty thousand dollars a month in about a year, because there's no protection for a commercial person. So, having seen that now, that neighborhood's all like it was a warehouse district, all lit up. My work in Baltimore, trying to do a warehouse district uh, in in this city has been extremely frustrated because I'm still dealing with that generation of owner. They're like, yeah, but you're black. How can I trust that you'll ever do any of this other kind of, even though I'm talking about new industries, things they don't know anything about, it's like, I'm still in the back of their mind. And I'm not saying they're bigots. Yeah. I'm saying they're in the back of their minds, it's like, yeah, but how are you ever going to find that money? I know how difficult it is because mm -hmm. there are no black people that work in my office yeah. and the ones that do are barely literate. Yeah. So I think that's part of the change is that we have to look at all those places that are blockading us uh -huh. because the built environment, to me, matters the most. It's the thing that will live after us. So if it costs about four or five million dollars a block to restore it, and I know that when you're done, it escalates in value, you leave a 17 million dollar block behind, that's gonna be good for somebody. But if we take the approach that it's gotta be good for everybody, that means that everybody's not gonna be able to buy. You don't have a whole block full of <coughs> like, you've gotta be a homeowner to live on this block. But that means that even if you're renting, you should live in competent housing. Your children shouldn't be poisoned by lead and arsenic and mold and rats and roaches and so forth and so on just because me and my friends are wealthy and you are not. So that's the opportunity of Baltimore. Yeah. Now, some politicians get that and some uh, maybe not so much. I don't think they really understand the value of the, the, the pure value of working in concert with all of your assets. You have intellectual assets in the city. They're amazing. You have activist assets in the city, people who are really ready to tell you, like, well, why are you going to do it that way? And that has a value if that voice comes in and it is um, not only competent, but actually productive. Are you just yelling because it wasn't you that thought of it, or are you yelling because we're doing something wrong? Those, those are legitimate mm -hmm. questions. Like my four-year-old, why? Good question. Why? Let me tell you why. And then if you look at where the politician actually is valuable to you, because they're supposed to be managing the public trust. Can I trust you? Wow. Or did you, did you stuff $17 million in your drawers or in the freezer? You have to be able to be called into question about the job that you're there to do. I'm doing this. You're doing that. I value what you're doing. I want to go to all those meetings, uh, politician X, Y, or Z. I'm glad that you're there. Thank you. Are you telling them the truth? Yeah. 
Are you collecting information from them just to make them feel that you want them to feel good about your collecting the information? Or are you really trying to be this transactional leader that says, hey, you all need to know this. And if you don't show up in Annapolis when I'm fighting for this, you agree to have me come back and tell all of you to shut the hell up. Exactly. Because and you didn't show up when I needed you to be there. Exactly. There's and the way that this thing works. So yeah. that's, that's part of what I think is a, a great opportunity in Baltimore is because I think there's a layer of honest, smart, uh, people of all ages, but there's a lot of new leadership coming into the forefront. And they are a little bit freer of the other nonsense because they don't need those five same six or seven systems to get to the people. They can have a very competent Facebook page and a great Instagram presence and active on Twitter and have hundreds of voices. Right. And then those hundred people share it. And then there's thousands of voices come to the forefront. So the forums matter, not for seven people to sit up there, bore the shit out of me, and then you give them 10 minutes for questions at the end. But what do you all want to know? What do you want us to do? Okay, okay, okay. Why do you want that? That sounds crazy. Yeah. Okay, but maybe it's not so crazy now that you qualified it. Da 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 da. That those areas of debate are super critical because we often have to investigate our thoughts. I could be just talking out loud and thinking about it, or I could go, or you could say something else. Is going, mm, never really thought about it that way. Okay, I got something for you. I thought about it now. Mm. Bang. And that improves your argument is because you never thought about it. But we can't do any of that if we're just yelling and screaming at each yeah. other. You see what I'm saying? Or, or, or saying, I don't need to know any of those it, it, or Yelling and screaming. Then the opposite is people now are afraid to say anything. Afraid to say anything. Which is now completely uh, shut down, crippled, any um, realistic version of conversation sure. that exists in the world. And um, the people quote unquote in power that may have wanted and may still have motivations in order to change things for the better sure. are afraid to question their constituents sure. or to say, hey, y'all ain't right. Come on. Which is not even that's not even that's not even smart. Who does that anywhere? Yep. Who goes into the office and just throws the money on the table and say, Well you all tell me how it's gonna work out. You have to inspect your expectations to get anything done. What gets measured gets done. And if you give me an agenda and I don't deliver on any of it, and you're still going to send me back? Like, okay, I, if I see that that's all it takes, then I'll just go down, party for three months, come back and go, oh, y'all, it was real tough. Uh, but you'll send me back again, won't you? It's not so much the money that they make at, in that thing. It's the money they can make because they're at the trough where all the money's being handed out, right? So that is, um, I, th I think that, it, that the, for me, and I'd be hard, I would argue with anybody about this, that the real estate game in Baltimore is a game changer because our neighborhood should not, we should not have uh, black life equated with poverty and degradation. Yeah. And right now it's collapsed. Yeah. It's like if it's a black neighborhood, it's supposed to look like X. Yeah. But many of us did not grow up in a black neighborhood looking like, I grew up in a poor neighborhood in DC and it was clean. Boy, you drop some trash on that street at your peril. And my neighbor was not a wealthy man. He worked for the trash company. But when he was out there cleaning up, you drop trash on that street. You better take that trash home. And even when because it was a value system. You see what I'm saying? Even when there, even when there was in the neighborhood I grew up, and even when there was like there was violence, but there wasn't abandoned houses. Right. Like there, there was like people getting shot, whatever. People running, whatever. But there were businesses. People lived in the homes, and there's like a direct correlation between. Which makes sense. People leaving, right? That activity, that ecosystem, that whatever. It's like when you take a species out of an ecosystem, you take the all alligators out of X place, everybody's gonna die. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a bird, sure. and right. whatever. Exactly. You take one thing out of it, everybody's dying. I think you, you nailed it. We, we were more aware of the rest of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I take an ecosystem approach mm -hmm. because if in fact you're gonna have a healthy neighborhood and you want young people to live in it, they gotta know what the schools look like. They have to know how far away groceries are. They have to know where the playgrounds are. If the playgrounds are glass strewn and taken over by you know, the Crips, they're not gonna go there. And so all of those things kind of matter. We've been used to being policed only 
and not having any accountability to each other. And I don't think that is necessarily the only yeah. way it could go, but you can't wax philosophic about, well, the good old days and we used to clean the stoops. And it's like, those days weren't that good. No. We were still getting our clocks clean. It's oh, just yeah. that more people had work because more people had some semblance of education. There was a place where a person who was only employed in the trades could still feed a family of four. Now, if you take all those jobs and send them to Guatemala, and there you're paying $6 a day, and this guy was used to making $34 a day, you will eviscerate both neighborhoods. And so we need to be aware of those things. That can't be like, I ain't trying to know what's going on in Guatemala. It's like, well, you should, because they sent your yeah. neighborhood to the, the, the largesse that used to produce in your neighborhood, they sent that to somebody else's neighborhood, yeah. and they're exploiting those workers. It is not possible to live well on $6 a day. So we have to look at the, the power that that ecosystem has if we take that whole approach. Yeah. That is the tremendous upside that's available for developers. And I use that term broadly because community developers, which is primarily what I do, um, um, has a, a value beyond just the, I bought it for this, I put it there, I flip it, I do it again. Flipped it to who? For what purpose? Do I want to, do I care about who's living on either side of me? I do. If nothing more enlightened self-interest, if you parking cars on your lawn and I put $350,000 in my house, it will not matter. Your parking cars on your lawn will still affect my property value. So we have a shared prosperity to a certain extent, no matter what, right? So I was like, brother, can you like do that in the backyard? Yeah. So that, I, I love it. Maybe you can work on my car, uh -huh. but not up front. See what I'm saying? You're ruining my curb appeal. Yeah. And so I think that that automatically in, in neighborhoods that are so close to each other, like Baltimore's a row home, row house kind of community until you get way out there. But there are some gorgeous neighborhoods yeah. in Baltimore that have been allowed to fall in a hole in the ground. Yeah. And when visitors come, they pull over and they go, please explain that to me. That's a mansion where I come from. And why is it all boarded up or stuffed with Section 8? Uh, 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 you know, rent uh, voucher holders, uh -huh. and you're not caring for them at all. Yeah. You're not providing anything to them at all. And some of those are the traditional people who are rent takers, yeah. and some of them should embarrass us yeah. about the conditions that we yeah. let people live in and claim it's their fault that it's that way. It was jacked up when you were taking the rent from them, dude, and never picking up the trash. How long have you been in Baltimore now? Off and on for 10 years. Okay. And you grew up in D.C.? Grew up in D.C. Right. Hop, skip, and a jump. Not even. Um, Same neighborhoods, different streets. Exactly. Literally. Um, what, is your, what is your gut feeling or what is your current sense of the uh, political landscape, as people like to say? I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm very hopeful about it. I see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of those politicians are in meetings that I'm at late at night and sometimes they're leaving and going to another one. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of very honest uh, people. Um, some of them need a little bit more courage, and that's okay. okay, because again, you have to be able to really be able to hang with the conversation with people who may be uninformed, yeah. because a lot of people are being misled by having, just because we have 49 channels of, of news, doesn't mean that you're getting good information. So it just depends on where people get their ideas from, and those are usually, you find out when they're expressed. And so I think there should be a lot more voter education that happens about what the process is, because then people have an unrealized ex expectation about what the outcome is. They have no idea what the process is. They have expect, well, I told you, so therefore, a, a new community center is going to land in my neighborhood, right? It's like, it, well, it would have if you had showed up at the zoning meeting. Yeah, we, we definitely have a consumer mentality when it comes to politics. Sure. It's like, oh, I, I ordered the Whopper. Right. Why I don't have a Whopper. And the other part of it is that then uh, that some of those, uh, if you really intend for people to know, yeah. you can't say, well, I put it out on the web if, in fact, your neighborhoods are not, don't have Wi-Fi yeah. deployed. Yeah. So you're saying so there's a dishonesty in the someone is profiting off of the way it is right now. And we have to be prepared to look at what that is. I literally was in a meeting about Wi-Fi distribution, and, they, and the guy stood up at the microphone and said that he put the notice on a street pole about the meeting. And it was like, I think that was AD 10 you were thinking about in Rome. That's how they used to share information. 
You put it on a pole. You know, back then they had a um, dude. A town crier, yeah, right? You, had the dude there was, was no town crier, so that's where I was, I mean, I was about to catch him on that funny. as well. It's like you put it up, but you didn't go out and tell everybody about it. So there's a place where you always must investigate um, a kind of a grifter mentality mm -hmm. that can sneak into anything where it looks like, ooh, that's juicy. Look at all the people gathered. And they'll show up and slide into the shot because they just want a photograph. And that's, that's a, a part of human nature. Yeah. But when I look at the younger leadership that's growing up here in Baltimore and some of the old, older ones that have kind of figured things out, figured out the way things really are, that I'm hoping that the next generation, who, as they start sh to rise in their own career, will realize there's a place where you're supposed to become kingmaker. You don't necessarily need to die in office. You really can't actually get to a place where you go, you know what, these are my people. I must sow into all of them so they understand, and they're gonna have my Rolodex. So you mess with them while I'm still here at your peril, because I'm gonna tell them exactly the way this thing works. And then when they get the agenda, they're going to go, ah, uh, well, er, see, I have this agenda, and I'm accountable to my constituents, and they want to know X, Y, and Z. Why are you putting the incinerator in my neighborhood if you can't put it over there? Yeah. Why are we still burning trash when you know if you go over there, they're doing it differently? Why are we not doing these things? Why are we spending, why are we prepared to spend $60,000 to incarcerate a person when there's not one $60,000 a year job in that household. So these are burning questions that we should actually, because politicians sit on those budget yep. meetings and so forth and allocate those dollars. And if you're only going to spend $5,000 per student, but $60,000 on their failure, well, that's, we should stop and go, I'm sorry, I'm not that smart. I don't understand that you have the 60, but you don't have more than five for education. I mean, when you've told everybody in all of your everything that education is the way out. So if it's the way, why do they get it? Why do those kids have iPads with all their books on it in the third grade and our kids don't have any Wi-Fi or guess this, get this, they don't have heat in their classroom. Isn't that like a 19th century thing? So we need to look at those things as places where, ah, this is still an injustice. It's backed by these things you've been doing always, but the future does not allow those two things to exist at the same time in your crowing about justice mm. or the Constitution or mm. the law or any of those things. Yeah. You have to be able to say, er, er, that doesn't work. Yeah. Thank you. This is great. This is Dr. Andre.